Psalm 118, verse 24 on the screen. Let's read it together. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, I made you read it for a reason. I wonder if someone would just do what we said that we would for a moment. I wonder if someone would rejoice. I, I don't know if you're going to run the aisle. I don't know if you're going to hop out of your pew and hit the ground run. I don't know, but I wonder if just for a moment we would do what we read that we would do. This is the day that the Lord's made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Would you lift both hands and then lift your voice? But don't leave it there. Bring your heart along with you for a moment. God, we're giving you praise right now. We are rejoicing. God, what a privilege, what an honor that we get to be your people this day, in this day. God, in this today, we are giving you our praise. We are giving you our promises. We are, God, we are giving you our very best. God, I ask that your kingdom would come in this room right now. God, see every heart that's turned heavenward in the last few moments. God, all of a sudden, we had the opportunity to correct our gaze, to God, to look heavenward and see your plan, your purpose. God, see that this thing is bigger than we are. It's bigger than the day that we had. It's bigger than the week that we're walking through right now. It's bigger than all of that. This is the day that you have made. And so we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. God, our feet are walking on the floor. We're privileged to have strength in our body. We're here in this room together singing and rejoicing. We've been saved. We've been redeemed. We've got a reason to rejoice choice tonight I wish someone would just do it one more time that felt pretty good hallelujah, hallelujah hallelujah just turn to your neighbor and tell him rejoice and you may be seated rejoice I if you would why don't we take a walk back to Easter weekend and we'll ascend Golgotha together often and the way that it should be, our focus is on that middle cross or the middle cross that artists have portrayed, the Christ being crucified and the price that's being paid, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We, we have a focus on that blood that's shed and lives that are saved, eternities that are impacted, futures that are given. I, I, we, we, we celebrate that, but I wonder if we could just take a glance to the side for a moment. There's a thief on each side of the cross. And the thieves <clears throat> each have an opportunity to accept, an op uh, accept what Christ is about to give to them or reject it. And there's one particular thief that <clears throat> this is his worst day. That day for him, he sees nothing but pain and death. He hears groans and moans, his own groans. His own moans. Gotha plays like a minor chord in every heart that's assembled there that day. There's no lullaby of hope. There's no sonnet of life. There's just harsh chords of death. The song that's being sung is a dru terrible one, gruesome one. But then the thief hears and sees something else. He hears a prayer that's prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And all of a sudden, that dreary battlefield is uplifted with hope for the moment. Forgiveness, how could that possibly be offered in a moment like that? And how would you receive something in that season of life? But nevertheless, he prays the prayer, not just for him to speak it, but for them to hear it. He prays on a Roman cross that was devised to bring torturous pain to him. And the thief's react. Initially, it's mockery. It says that the robbers that were crucified with him reviled him in Matthew 27, 44. You see, if you've been hurt, then you tend to hurt. Hurt people, hurt people. The thief hurts. Having been wounded, he wounds. Even Golgotha has a pecking order, and this thief refuses the bottom rung, so he joins those that are mocking and those that are ridiculing. Even though he's on a cross right to the side of the Christ. He saved others himself. He can't save. King of Israel, is he? Let him come down from that cross. Why doesn't he allow the angels to come and ascend and lift him up? Why all, all of the ridicule, all of the people that are condemning what's happening on the cross. But Jesus doesn't retaliate. And for the first time that day, the thief sees kindness. He hears grace. 
He hears a patient God at work in his life. At first, he just softens. He stops mocking, and then he attempts to stop the mocking of others. He, he begins to say, wait, wait don't, don't. We, we deserve this, but not him. There's, there's something different about this man. He's not like the rest of us. He's not like any of them. This man, there's something different about him. He did nothing to deserve what we did, what we're deserving of. The thief senses he's close to someone that's greater than him. He requests a recommendation. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. There, there's, <clears throat> there's a difference. He begins to say when you come into your kingdom. He, he understands. He, he knows there's something different about this one that's beside him. And then Jesus utters the promise that many of us have read over and over again. Today. Someone say today. You'll be with me in paradise. That day turned into a today opportunity for that man. The bad day of the bad man is met with a gracious gift of a merciful, loving Savior. Mercy. Grace. We sing about it. We preach about it. But sometimes are we hesitant to receive it because of what we have done? You see, there is grace. The first blank in your handout is there is grace for shame-filled days. And the thief allows us to see this purpose that God has in granting grace to each one of us. He watches this Christ, this Jesus of Nazareth, as he entrusts his mother to his friend and honors those around him. He sees the God who wrote the book on grace in action. He sees the God who coaxed Adam and Eve out of the bushes, who coaxed murderous Moses out of the desert, the God who made a place for David, the God who didn't give up on Elijah even though Elijah had given up on God. That is what the thief saw that day. He, he sees all this happening and he hears this activity going on around him. He hears what the fugitive Moses heard in the desert. He heard what depressed Elijah heard in the desert. He heard about what the adulterous David heard after Bathsheba. He, he hears what fickle Peter hears after the rooster crows and the storm-tossed disciples heard after the wind stopped and the cheating woman heard after the men left. Rocks thudding on the ground. He hears. He hears grace. The Samaritan woman, before the disciples came back to the well, was offered the opportunity. The I mean, she should have been condemned. The one that knew everything about her chose not to condemn her, but to love her. Grace. Paul, hard-headed, killing the church of the New Testament, was stopped in his tracks by a light that knocked him off of his beast to save him. That's grace. A uh, quick question in the room tonight. How many would have picked Saul? Right. Paul. That's murderous Paul. Who would pick him? No one picked him. But that is grace. And God's grace opens the door for the greatest apostle that the New Testament sees and has ever seen. Grace. That hearing grace in action. The blind man heard it when Jesus found him on the street. The paralytic man heard it when his friends lowered him down through the roof. The disciples would hear it from that Christ when they were ready to turn and run, but he met them on the beach and called them back to action. Grace. The official language, I know, I know all of us think we're going to speak English in heaven. That's why we're trying to teach everybody English. Just teasing. It's fun when you, when you work with, uh, with folks learning language. Although we, we, you know, really, sometimes we got to put ourselves on the other side of that coin. We're so quick to, let us teach you. How about they teach us? Have you ever tried? I can't even say some people's names. So it's so refreshing when I get, you know, they tell me their name. They say, what's your name? Jack. Easy. Jack. Perfect. What was your name again? Da -da 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 -da. 
From now on, you will be called Jed. <laughs> I know we think English is going to be the language spoken in heaven or Greek or maybe Hebrew or who knows. But the truth is, is that there is a language of grace that you can hear if you listen closely because God has a plan for every one of us to hear that in our life. You see, he says that <clears throat> this day you'll be with me in paradise, Luke 23, verse 43. And, and God turned that day into the day of promise, the day of hope, the day today. Turned it into a today that transformed his future forever. It wouldn't be a backdoor entrance. It wasn't like a late night arrival. It wasn't, um, you know, we're just going to sneak in the side door. No, he, he promises that today you're going to be with me in paradise. And grace comes like a golden sunrise in the midst of a dark night. And Golgotha becomes a mountain of transfiguration for that man in that moment. That's powerful. I feel the Holy Ghost right now, actually. Because God's trying to talk to someone and say, regardless of where you are, I can reach you if you'll hear the language of grace. You see, the problem is that so often we mute our own ears with all the wrong that we have done. We stick our fingers in our ears and say, you don't understand what I've done. And then we refuse to hear the preacher that's preaching or the song that's being sung or the person in the pew next to you that's just reaching out with love and kindness to say, you know what, we accept you because God has a plan for your life. And so often in those moments, we stick our fingers in our ears and say, uh-uh, I'm not going to hear it. When God's just reaching, God's letting every song be directed to your pew. God's letting every word that the preacher says being directed your way. And God's desperately trying to get your attention. He's hollering in a language that you've yet to learn called grace. And you've got to be willing to hear it. Someone just pull your fingers out of your ears and allow God to talk to you tonight because he's reaching into your life to turn you around, to give you a new focus, to give you a new direction. I, I feel a little bit of help in the Holy Ghost tonight. I, I wish someone would just say, I believe that God wants to do that for me. I believe that God wants to do that in my life. I, I believe that God wants to transform my present and my future. I believe that God wants to transform my eternity. That is the power of grace. By grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves. And God is saying, you know what? It's universal. If you'll be willing to hear it, I'm willing to reach you right where you are. How many are glad tonight that we serve a God that's full of grace? I'm glad for that. I'm grateful. Today, God, you know, we, we, we want to put ourselves on a, on a P90X spiritual transformation that if we do this for 30 days then we'll go on to stage two for the next 30 days and and then we'll hit stage three for the next 30 days and if I get through all of that then I'll let myself receive the grace of God can I tell you you're never going to get there on your own you've just got to step into a place and receive that voice of grace speaking into your life take your fingers out of yours get get the earplugs out it's funny, we've been working around here doing some construction, hammers going and drills drilling and impact drivers driving. And, and sometimes, you know, it's just, I start wearing earplugs because at the, at the end of the day, my head's like, nah, 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 nah. but the crazy thing is, is that when we all start putting earplugs in, none of us can hear each other. And so the tone and the talk that usually happens, where it's kind of muted, it's more like, hey, have you had it Pass me the screwdriver. Somebody get me the screws. Patrick, can you hear me? Sometimes for the fun of it, I don't call Pastor Matt, Pastor Matt, while we're working. I, I call him Master Pat. <laughs> Master Pat, get me the impact driver. <laughs> and sometimes he... You're trying to have a conversation and realize my ears are plugged. Huh. But if that happens in our lives, we, we, we allow all of our past wrongdoings to... And we allow the sin from the month or the sin from the week or the sin from yesterday or the sin from this morning... 
compressed in our ears until we can't hear the voice of God speaking the language of grace in our lives. And we have to remove all of that stuff and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I have got to receive the gift that you have for me called grace. If the thief could do it, you can too. You see, we look at our failures, we look at our sin, we look at our wrongdoings. Pastor Jack, are, are you saying that it's all right? No, I'm, please don't make me qualify everything we're talking about tonight. We've got to live righteous and holy. We've got to walk in truth. We've got to, we've got to do everything we can to do what God has called us to do and be who God has called us to be. Everyone know what we're talking about. But when you fail, God's grace is sufficient for you. You see, we'll nail ourselves to the cross of our mistakes, stupid mistakes, stupid errors, repetitive sin. So what do we see when we do? Are we willing to see a Savior that died for us? Are we willing to hear a voice calling us to come out from among them and be separate? Or will we walk our wayward way because we failed, not others, but we have failed ourselves. And if we aren't careful, we end up like the thief who wouldn't receive what God had for him. Forgive them for they know not what they do. You see, pride won't always let us forgive ourselves. That's what it is. Pride. I knew a man once, great potential, Great transformation, great testimony, great triumph, and great pride. And a simple failure caused him to walk away from God for decades. And the impact of that sojourn still haunts him today. It was only until he turned back around that God began to put things back in order. But it wasn't that others wouldn't forgive him. It wasn't that God wouldn't forgive him. It was that he couldn't forgive himself. He wouldn't hear the voice of grace. And if you allow God, if you just begin to hear all of a sudden, hearing by the hearing of that word of God, the hearing of the grace of God, it opens the portal to promise in our life. And we get to walk back into what God had initially intended for us to become. Yes, there's a journey, and yes, there's, there's <clears throat> ramifications from sin that, that happens in our life, but I'll tell you what, on this side of grace, it's way better than on that side. Walk into the grace that God has for you. There is grace for shame-filled days. Take it from the thief. He'll tell you, God can turn your worst day. Would someone circle that into your best day? God can do that. Number two, we have gratitude for ungrateful days. I'm not sure, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard about the <clears throat> excerpts of the diary from a dog and the ex excerpts of the diary of the cat. The dog at 8 a.m. is, <clears throat> his entry says, oh boy, dog food, my favorite. At 9.30, he says, oh boy, a car ride, my favorite. 940 says, oh boy, a walk, my favorite. 1030, oh boy, another car ride, my favorite. Sounds like the teens of today. 1130 a.m., oh boy, more dog food, my favorite. 12 p.m., oh boy, the kids are home, my favorite. I'm moving into my dog voice. <laughs> 1 p.m., oh boy. <laughs> the yard, my favorite. Just because some of you were, I was losing you. Um, <clears throat> 4 p.m., oh boy, the kids again, my favorite. 5 p.m., oh boy, dog food again, my favorite. You getting the point? 5.30, oh boy, mom's home, my favorite. 6 p.m., oh boy, playing ball, that's my favorite. 8.30 p.m., oh boy, sleeping on master's bed, my favorite. And then the diary <clears throat> of the cat is a little different. Day 283 of my captivity. My captors continue to haunt me with bizarre little dangling objects. They dine lavishly on fresh, fresh meat while I'm forced to eat dry cereal. 
I'm sustained by the hope of escape and the mild satisfaction that I derive from running a few pieces, ruining a few pieces of furniture. Tomorrow I may eat another house plan. I attempted to kill my captors this morning by weaving through their walking feet. Nearly succeeded. Must try this strategy at the top of the stairs. I'm seeking to disgust and repulse these vile oppressors. I once again induced myself to vomit. <laughs> vomit on their favorite chair. I don't know why I just thought right there, happy birthday, Annette. It's not in my notes. I, I think because maybe I heard you laugh. Must try this on their bed. <laughs> vomit, that is. <clears throat> to display my diabolical disposition, I decapitated a mouse and deposited the headless body on their kitchen floor. They only cooed and condescendingly patted my head and called me a strong little kitty. Hmm, not working according to plan. During a gathering of their accomplices, they placed me in solitary confinement. <laughs> I, I overheard that my confinement was due to my power of allergies. Must learn what this means and learn how to use it to my advantage. I'm convinced the other household captives are flunkies, perhaps snitches. The dog is routinely released and seems native, <laughs> naively happy to return. He is, no doubt, a half-wit. The bird speaks with the humans regularly, must be an informant. I am certain he reports my every move. Due to his current placement in, my metal cage, in the metal cage, his safety is assured, but I can wait. It's only a matter of time. The day <clears throat> of a dog and a cat. One content, and the other is conniving. One grateful, and the other sees life completely different, even though they have the same locale and location. So the question is, <clears throat> which animal are you more like? Oh, you thought that was just a rhetorical question. Which animal are you more like. Which animal do we all want to be more like? No wonder people, I don't know, no wonder I want a dog more than a cat. Oh boy, sun up, my favorite. Instead of, shut the blind. Oh boy, breakfast, my favorite. Oh boy, coffee, my favorite. Oh, oh, here we go. Oh boy, traffic, my favorite. Oh boy, vacuuming, my favorite. Oh boy, the kids left their clothes in the middle of the bathroom floor, my favorite. Oh boy, a root canal, my favorite. No. We haven't got there yet, have we? But gratitude for ungrateful days. What, what a transformation we could have in our lives if we took the day that God has given us and said, today, I'm going to choose to be grateful. Today, I'm going to be grateful for the simple things. Today, I'm going to be grateful for water to drink and food that we have on our table. Today, I'm going to be grateful that I live in Canada. Canada Day. Today, I'm going to be, I'm, yeah, thanks, Kelty. And one other. Someone clap because we're in Canada. Let, it, let everybody watching online know that we love this nation that we get to be a part of. <clears throat> oh, boy. Our favorite. You see, in your text, you can read about it. We all have that choice, and Jesus knew that we did too, because he talked about it. He said, 10 leprous men illustrated what we're talking about with cats and dogs and humor and a Wednesday night service in the middle of our week. It says, as Jesus entered a certain village, you can read it with me, it's in your hand. There met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, one, someone say one. So that, I, I think maybe Jesus knows that's the odds of us getting it right. Probably about one in 10 that we accurately that we accurately assess the day that God has given us because I'm like you we can all think about the things that we've got to do because they weren't done right got a car that failed in inspection got to fix the bumper and do back brakes mm. 
don't like it. Or we can be grateful that we have a vehicle that doesn't need a motor this year. We can be grateful for that. We can be, it's how we, it's attitude. It's the cat. The cat sees the glass half empty. The dog sees the glass half full. I, I'm just wondering, how, how's your perspective on your day? You say, Pastor Jack, you're talking about the most simple stuff. Absolutely, because <clears throat> we still haven't passed the test. You notice how I did that? I'm in your group. We. Not the royal we, meaning you, and I've got this all together. I'm talking about we. You and I are still learning about how to approach the day that God has given us. I think that's why we started with grace, because any one of us that's, that's got today is only here because of the grace that God has given. It was those leprous men, let's, let's read together, one, right? One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan, throws that in there, the one that was outcast, the one that was pushed to the sidelines, the one that would have been, had the sidelong glances as everybody walked by the Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. Out of the ten, nine continued on their way, ungrateful. Maybe they're thankful. Maybe, wow, this is great. Thankful for what God has done. But I think it is a picture. God's saying, be careful because it is so easy for us to slip into that cynical mentality where all of a sudden, I don't know what those nine guys were doing. Maybe they had their plans all drawn out. When healing happens, this is what I'm going to do. Maybe they were so focused on the new future that they had that they forgot about what God had just done. We can do the same thing. We forget about what God has done in our lives. And as a result, we are ungrateful. But God is wanting a people full of gratitude. We, we've got to have gratitude for ungrateful days. In the midst of ungrateful days. In the midst of a society that's ungrateful. Because we want more. We're consumed with the desire for more. And unhappy with what we have. Contentment would be the greatest gift you give yourself. Because if you are content, you open the door to gratitude. It's impossible to be grateful for something you're not content about. You can't. You can say you are. You can act it. But until you're content with what you have and who you are and, and the way that God's created you and what God has given you and the people that God has put in your life and the church that you get to attend, and instead of always looking somewhere else for something you don't have, what if you just took a moment, looked in the mirror and looked down and looked around and said, wow, God, thank you for what you've done. I, I, I think there's a strong, powerful message. It's not just a, a quick lesson that will check off gratitude for ungrateful days. I think that there's a powerful lesson right here that could transform our lives, that could change our attitudes, that, that could improve our dispositions, that could transform the way that we interact with people and the way that we approach our job and the way that we approach our week and the way that we approach everything around us if we are just grateful for what God has given us now. We're people of promise. We always look to the promise that God has yet to come, the healing that's coming. Yes, we pray for it. We have faith to believe God for it, but the balance to that is to be able to say, thank you for what you've done for me here and now. Thank you for what you've already given me. Thank you. Thank you, God. If you never did another thing for me, you've been good. God's great. That's gratitude. Someone just, could you be grateful for a moment? Not, not just to the person around you, but could you tell God how good he's been in your life? Would you take a moment and be the one that's thankful? Could you take a moment and be the one leper that returned? Could you just go back for a moment in your mind to how God turned your life around, to salvation that impacted your family and your future? Thank you, God, for what you've done already. If you never did another thing for us, I'm grateful for what you've done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And would you do it one more time? I, that, that could change our worship services. It could change the way that... Come on, it could change the way that, that we interact with people. We 
Come on, we're talking about, we're grateful for what God has already done. And I know it's a little bit of effort right now. It's about putting our hand in the air. It's an exercise of faith right now. But would someone just begin to thank God? Be grateful for what God has already done. God, I'm grateful for the family that you've given me. I'm grateful for truth that I've I'm grateful that I'm just sitting here in this building right now. I'm grateful that I'm just watching this by way of webcast. I'm grateful that I've got a computer that I can take part in this service right now. I'm grateful right now, God. I'm, I'm thankful. I don't want to be the nun that can continue on their merry way and, and are so focused on themselves. I want to be thankful for what you've done. I want to be thankful for how you're working. I want to be thankful for everything you've already given to me, God. I want to be thankful for grace. I want to be thankful for sin that's washed. I want to be thankful for a price that's been paid. I, I want to be thankful for promise that you've given and faith that you've received, God, that we've received. I thank you for that. Grateful. Grateful. Grateful for trouble? Can we be grateful in the, in the bad times? Can we be, be grateful? I can't get that out. Can we be grateful when we can't talk and we need to? Grateful? Are you grateful for trouble? It's Robert Updegraff that said this. He said, you ought to be glad for the troubles on your job because they provide about half your income. If it were not for the things that go wrong, the difficult people with whom you deal and the problems of your working day, someone could be found to handle your job for half of what you're being paid. So start looking for more troubles. Learn to handle them cheerfully and with good judgment as opportunities rather than irritations. And you will find yourself getting <laughs> ahead at a surprising rate. For there are plenty of big jobs waiting for people who are not afraid of trouble. Thank God. How many already noticed that I got uh, the header on page two wrong? Sorry, page three. You can circle that with your red pen. Trouble. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble with the grammar people. Probably threw my whole hand out. Thankful for things that... I don't think that we should try and create things that go wrong, but, but here's what I know, that we're going to encounter people that don't get things right. Our, our days are filled with, you know, it's, sometimes it's, it is frustrating, isn't it? Let's be honest. It's frustrating when people are, who are in customer service don't know how to serve customers. <laughs> if you work in a customer service environment, those customers are there for you to serve. Does, that, does anybody... Has anyone ever been served at a restaurant and you feel like you're in irritation because you're there to get food? I've been there. And, not, and I'm trying, I'm, oh, here we go, pride, pride talking. But <clears throat> I, we're, we're usually very careful about not landing. Here, here's, a, here's a good idea for, you, for everybody. If they close at 9, don't show up at 10 to 9. Expect great service. <laughs> well, so. I'm, we're going to have a, a laugh track with an amen on it, and I can just. <laughs> if, that's a, if that's a revelation, to, or if, that's, if you don't know why I just said that, then we have to talk. <laughs> really? <laughs> because you represent our church. However, if you're doing everything that you can to be kind and considerate and Sometimes people, just, they just need a little help or maybe a little grace. But every one of us, every one of us are going to have challenging situations because what's, what's passed to the four chairs? Because somebody was simple. Because somebody didn't know. Because they weren't wise. They haven't had a life experience. They're, it, pastoring would be great if it wasn't for the people. I'm only teasing. I'm teasing. I didn't even get a chuckle out of that one. I didn't give you time. Totally teasing. But Brother Stone King, you know, we have a, there are a few stories of a few people that have created challenges for churches or pastors. And, and often when he's talking to us about something like that, he'll say, it's job security. <laughs> it is job security. Thank God we're all just people. And so we're going to have trouble, but can we be grateful for trouble that happens? Can we be grateful when we're trying 
to negotiate. And it can get wearisome. That's probably one of the greatest challenges of our faith is that when we're having all this consistent trouble from people not doing what they should have done right the first time, those irritations, and but if we can turn those into opportunities and let them become learning experiences for someone that doesn't know, then you could change their life while gracefully accepting the problem that comes into your life. Number three, forgiveness for bitter days. We'll move quick. Forgiveness. You see, if we have these in our days, our days are going to get better. Every day deserves a chance because often our environment or our circumstances will allow bitterness to come into our lives. Forgiveness for bitter days. It was Peter that came and asked the question, probably because he wanted to be certain that he uh, did what was required. Matthew 18, 21, 22, Peter came and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Until seven times, it sounds good. Um, Jesus said, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. If you look at Romans 3.23, it says to sin is to fall short of the glory of God, that that we all have fallen short. But if uh, before we're so quick to condemn someone else and start calculating uh, all of the wrong that they've done, before you start to say, well, I've I should be free of my requirement to forgive by now because you've got your calculator and your memo pad. And does anyone remember that Corinthians said love doesn't keep record of wrong? So if you're not keeping record of wrong, guess what? That person is at one. No matter how many times they've failed you before, that's just, I'll just throw that in there. But Jesus said, uh, 70 times 7. It's not, it's not a numerical number that Peter's supposed to calculate with his uh, abacus. Is that what that was? It was about having a heart of forgiveness constantly. We can come back to the music. So before we start pointing our fingers at everybody else that's doing wrong, let's, let's just do a quick calculation um, in our own lives for a moment. Are you, are you ready? How often do we fall short? How often do you fall short? Um, Let's just consider this. Worry. You can write that in your blank. Worry is falling short on faith. So if anybody worried today, guess what? Start adding it up. How about impatience is falling short on kindness? Anybody impatient today? Anybody waited on hold? Here's, Here's my question. How often, how long does it have to be unusual call volume? Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? Sorry for your wait, but it's a higher than usual call volume. If I hear that every time I call, it's not a higher than usual call volume. You have a high call volume. Please accommodate the callers. Okay, here, see? (laughs) Fail. A critical spirit is falling short on love when you're full of criticism when it becomes your outlook and your vantage point what can I see wrong about somebody else about something else about somewhere else if criticism is your (laughs) it's what you have for breakfast lunch and supper then there's a lack of love somewhere in your life and if criticism is what you've got to say speak act then there's a shortage in love and and so let's just say that we fall short only 10 times per hour <gasps> never well, let's, let's start really calc- let's start looking through the lens of God's perfection and let's see how far we run so 10 sins per hour that's pretty modest Um, That's why I think we need to pray without ceasing. (laughs) And we got 16 hours a day. So if we multiply 160 sins per day by 365 days per year, and we multiply the average lifespan of 74 years, that equals about 4,300,000 sins per person. That's a little more than 70 times 7. And that's the man in the mirror. 
the woman. I was trying to think of the name of that. Not in the mirror, but that's us. That's if we only fall short 10 times per hour. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. We can be grateful that God forgives us. So let's allow forgiveness in the day that we have. How many are ready to forgive? Oh, before we rule forgiveness out, how many know that God has forgiven you much? How many know that if we were calculating, then then we would have a great level of failure and we wouldn't have the privilege of being freed from the wrong that we have done? when we calculate all the wrongdoing in our own lives, then we are way more apt to forgive those that have wronged us. It was Antoine Fisher. was a man who was abandoned by his parents when he was a child, and he went on the search to find his parents. He took his last name, Fisher, and he went through the phone book and the area that he was from, that he knew that he was from, and he began to call everybody with that last name. And remember when there was a phone book? We know that this is a little while ago. <clears throat> and finally he found, he happened on someone that knew his family. And that person said, well, you have a large family, and they invited him for Thanksgiving to come. And Antoine Fisher met his family, and finally the brother of his mother said, if you'd like to meet your mom, then I'd like to bring you to meet her. And that was a very emotional time. You can only imagine a lifetime without his parents and now he's about to meet his mom and he's got a million questions that he wanted to ask. He wanted to say, why did you abandon me and why did you leave me behind? Why did you put, put me into state care and a foster system that I was wronged so frequently and felt unloved and it impacted his life? And now he pulled himself together, a security guard and working in Western United States but it says the door opened and his, his uncle brought him to meet his mother. He said the person that he met was so frail, so much older than she was. His uncle said, this is Antoine Fisher. And in that moment, she said, oh no. And she was so filled with shame that she turned and unsteadily worked her way back. He said, in that moment, he said, I realized that I could choose to harbor hurt or I could allow myself to forgive. Because this person, he said, that he met was in a far worse state than he was. And it was his statement that I closed your hand out with. He just simply said this, in the end, we all choose what lives on the inside of us. In the end, we all choose whether or not we forgive, whether or not we walk in the grace that God has given us, whether or not we have gratitude in every single one of our days, whether or not we act like that. Antoine Fisher said, I had a choice in that moment and I chose to forgive my mom because she was in a far worse place than I was. And I think sometimes we need to realize that we don't know the reasons why people hurt us. But we can choose to forgive the ones that have wronged us. And if we do, then we open the door for God's forgiveness to work in our life in a powerful way. So those are just three days and three of the ten days that we're going to walk through over the next few weeks, but I think those are powerful principles that we can embrace to change the course the direction and the focus of that that we have in every single day. How many are going to choose to embrace those? You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea if you just took that hand out home and before you crumpled it up or before you 
lost it in the kitchen garbage can when you get home, uh, why not just take a moment and leave it on the counter? Take, a, take the opportunity over the next few days and read through that and say, God, is there, is there anything that I need to work on in me? Is there something that I should do? Is there something that I'm missing? Is there, is there something that I haven't been grateful for that you've given me? Is there an area of my life that I'm closing out grace, that I'm guilty, that I'm shame-filled? Is there anything that I'm missing? Is there someone that I haven't forgiven that it would free me? It wouldn't just free them, but it would free me if I let forgiveness reign in my life. I, I wonder if there was an opportunity that God is presenting tonight that could transform our lives. Why don't we stand together? Those are a few things to think about. Anybody still thankful for what God's doing in your life? How many grateful for a God that's like that? I wonder if we could just pause and praise him for a minute. Someone just lift your voice and give him thanks. Jesus, we are so very grateful over and over again. God, you've forgiven us. So I pray that we would let forgiveness be a part of who we are. God, let us be people that are thankful. Let us be people that are fulfilled with gratitude. And God, today I pray that we'd allow your grace to work in our lives. In every area, God, cleanse us, call us. God, purify us and put purpose in our life today. God, someone came into this room. It was this day for them. It was, it was this day of grief, this day of sorrow, this day of pain, this day of hopelessness. But God, today, you're calling us to be at your side, to be the people that you called us to be. God, we accept that invitation. God, we accept your grace to work in our lives. Transform us by the power of your word, I pray. In Jesus' name, we ask that so someone just speak his name.